Well, I should say thank you very much also for making it here to the last talk on the very last day. It was a big night last night, I think you all know. It was the big parkour night. I'm sure quite a lot of you were at that. Um, so I'm especially pleased that you've managed to hang on uh, to 4 p.m. today. Because of that night, it's also particularly appropriate that we have three of the people who were actually involved in putting that together. Um, Samuel Leuenberger is the curator of the parkour program. Um, he's also the director of SALTS, which shows young Swiss and international artists in Bursfelden, um, which is quite near here, I believe. Um, and he was also one of the curators of the 14 Rooms project, which some of you may remember from 2014. Um, next to him, we have Than Hussein Clark. He, he's an artist who, um, I would say, examines authenticity, theatricality, gay culture, amongst a whole load of other issues. He's had a raft of shows at major public and private institutions, from the Liverpool Biennial, uh, the Ludwig Museum in Cologne, and MIT at Massachusetts. Um, and last night, he showed the full-length version of Yes, 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 All the News That's Fit to Print, a four-hour performance in a modernist 1930s church near the Kunstmuseum. And next to me, I have Marvin Gay Chetwind. She was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2013, and she's also had some major exhibitions I mean, the spaces including the Bergen Assembly in Norway, uh, the New Museum in New York, the Edinburgh Festival, Liverpool Biennial as well, I think, yeah. Um, and, yes. <laughs> and here she was showing um, two pieces, the Green Room and the Science Lab, which was in a little, I thought it was a bar, but I think it was actually a laundry, uh, but a little room near the Munster. Um, and she also did a procession last night called the Panther Ejaculates, which if you didn't see it, I slightly leave it to your imagination. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> But, 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 but basically, to kick us off, and for those who might not have been there, or even if you were there and you'd like to know a little bit more about the programme and the works that were on show, um, Samuel, I wondered if you would just give us a little insight into what you were thinking about when you put the parkour programme together and the artists and works you chose, but particularly why you chose Than and Marvin to perform. Thank you, Jane. Yes, um... Just a quick recap for the people who don't know Parkour Night. It's part of uh, Parkour, which is a curated project in the inner city of Basel, the old part of Basel. So it's a mile away from here, between the Kunstmuseum, the whole area between the Kunstmuseum and uh, the Three King Hotel, so between the two bridges. And there, throughout the week, um, I was presenting 22 interventions um, by international artists from all over the place. Um, sort of parkour night almost becomes like the festivities, the end of the week celebration of this one week long uh, intervention into public and private space um, where we're always depending on having a lot of uh, welcoming hands from people living on these grounds, opening up the doors for us. And the special thing about parkour night is that um, I, I have the liberty to invite, to, to curate, so to speak, a second program parallel to parkour. So I can include artists who already have a presentation at parkour, like Marvin, and I can invite also uh, artists who not necessarily are represented by a gallery that's showing at Art Basel. So I can really show a whole range of artists, also a younger generation of artists, uh, and, and mix this sort of experience up. Um, parkour Night is obviously a, um, a night where things are open till midnight, all the institutions stay open, and it's really become a sort of like performance and happening evening. Um, so for me, it was a, um, it's a fantastic opportunity to really see how we can engage basically in, in, with the public in a real space, so to speak, and not in exhibition halls and not in a museum, et cetera, et cetera. What happens if we take uh, something onto the streets, like the procession yesterday? What happens if we occupy uh, already a space that might have a very strong characteristic or content, like an old church? So um, in this case, Besides Marvin and Than, who's in Clark, we, you know, I also invited uh, Wu Tsang to contribute something. Itzia Okaris, uh, important uh, performance artist from Spain. Um, Eric Hoptan, a ba Basel-based artist and a fellow musician friend of his, Julius Sartorius, and uh, a couple other positions. And for me, of course, it's interesting to show sort of a 
not a span, but like um, it was very interesting to see and, and to experience how you can construct if you construct a, a different sort of performative experiences. Um, how much control and director driven might one be, how spontaneous and, 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 and um, yeah, collaborative another might be, how community based it is, or how much it's just supposed to be seen on a stage by an audience without necessarily interaction. And, and this is in this case with uh, Than and Marvin, a wonderful, wonderful uh, span that we were able to see here. Than uh, really um, went all the way in producing a full theatrical work, you know, duration four hours. Uh, we built a stage above the seating area against the organ and the backdrop of the 1937 modernist church. And uh, within a very limited amount of time, you wrote a fabulous 180 page uh, script and brought his entourage and uh, the people he's working with already in London uh, over and designed the costumes, designed the stage design, designed the crops. And um, we had, of course, also the, the luck to, in this case, to get additional funding from MGM Resorts, Arts and Culture. So we were able to slightly produce a larger, a larger presentation, a much larger presentation. And therefore also, as an exception, show it on a Monday night already, almost like a teaser, the first hour of the four hour epic drama in Wednesday evening, another hour, and then it accumulated in this presentation on Saturday night. Uh, with Marvin, it was a very a fan I've worked with before a couple times before, so it was a, it was something that grew out of conversations. I, I, I started to understand how he builds narratives, and I was just very intrigued by it. Marvin, I actually I never told you. I, I invited you. I, I came to invite you because um, a few years ago at the Migros Museum, I was very touched by your show. <laughs> and um, now that I have the opportunity to curate parkour, you know, I can. Which which one? Which one? Which one at Migros? Uh, you had several ones. <laughs> 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 when you, when you still had your old name. The, is it the one that was like a big static show with with sculptures in 2007, or is it more that I've done some small live performances yeah. more recently in the no, last two 2007. years? Okay. okay. I was working in the house at the Kunsthalle Zurich just at the time. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, and now with. Do you hear that? Does it work? Yes, I think it works. I think yeah. mine's doing yeah, a bit fine. the same. Yeah, You're it's fine? good. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I was um, with Marvin. I was just always very intrigued. Also, the um, how you can build a scenario that seems to be that seems to be so spontaneous. That is so spontaneous in many ways, and of course, that's completely characterized by many many years of experience by working with the same performers over and over. And actually, where of course also a a, uh, Are the people laughing in the audience, <laughs> uh, <laughs> those ones. <laughs> I, I wonder what it means. <laughs> um, and, you know, and just to see how, how far you can drive the idea of also sort of a, a loose thinking in general terms and uh, how you can actually go along with a set of maybe comfortable or uncomfortable <laughs> uh, agreements that you have within your team and actually just build something uh, um, what seems to the audience extremely spontaneous. And uh, for you to take, this, to take this challenge to actually go onto the street out of this communal room that you chose, um, that's part actually also of another church on the other spectrum of where Fan was showing. Um, Quite a lot of churches though in that loads. area. It's, it's Do you know how many? There's something like 10. I don't know. It's no, crazy. No, no. Like, <laughs> That's a lot. Four, yeah. and we use them all. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so it was for me, of course, just really fabulous to just get into the social web of how, how you function and then how it came out was in both cases actually to me a surprise because you wrote a new piece, you developed actually a new piece out of the two installations you merged. And uh, I think yesterday was a great success. We could experience this together. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit before we dive deeply into this issue of the safe space, just a little bit about how you put your, your performance together and you know, what, what, what people would have kind of seen and experienced if they didn't see it. Sure, no problem. Um, so uh, we started about five weeks ago or six weeks ago. 
um, to, to build up the play um, using a couple of source texts. One was Ibsen's Enemy of the People from 1882. Another one was um, a Brazilian novel from 1958 called The Chronicle of the Murdered House, which was written by a Brazilian artist and novelist and playwright called Lucio Cardoso, who is the mentor of the Brazilian novelist Clarice Lipiscar. Um, and then we also started drawing from a Giraudoux play called The Mad Woman of Chaillot from 1947. And uh, it really started coming together when I found a, a television version of this novel from 1971 that I had translated from the Portuguese. And then that um, be was the sort of skeleton that we started with with the actors. Um, and during that process, we were also working on uh, designing the actual stage architecture, designing the stage furniture, and sort of rehearsing seven days a week from 10 to 10, um, pretty much. Um, and that process led into the performance which we did on Monday and Wednesday, an hour section, and then the four hour section last night. Uh, where people would have seen 10 actors on the stage uh, singing, dancing, um, also uh, going through, there was 56 scenes in the play um, and uh, a off book. Um, I was in it as well. Uh, a lot of the actors, again, similarly, uh, I've been working with for six or seven years. Um, people keep coming back, which is, I always, Thank, thank God. Um, and uh, the play sort of tells vaguely the story aligned with the book about a patrician Brazilian family that falls apart when uh, one of the brothers in the family marries a girl from the city who comes to the country. And uh, things go a bit crazy and sad, probably. I think it's very interesting that you use the word play. Marvin, would you use the word play, but maybe in a different way, the word play about your piece? What was the process? Uh, maybe I'm thinking perhaps of the, of the, of the one that was in the, uh, the washroom. The, the... I can correct the rumors. I think it's a community space for the church, but in its historical sense, and it's really interestingly written up very sensitively in this booklet. Possibly, not, of good possibly not very sensitively described by me. I apologise. No, it's there's a particular Swiss humour. It's very understatement and it's very very amusing. And it uh, makes out that there's a <clears throat> some sort of like almost a freedom fighter or some sort of like civil rights person uh, had their laundry washed there, their underpants washed there. Okay. So historically, it was a, a laundry, which is interesting. But when we were using it, it was more like a sort of slightly untrendy community centre. But go on, what was the actual question? Oh, Something I to was, do with play. I, I, no, I was going to ask you about, if you would mind just explaining yeah. a little mm -hmm. bit about how you put your work together and what it, what it might yep. feel like. Yeah, happily. Um, the, I'm, I'm very happy to um, use lo lots of different terms and words, and uh, I really enjoy... Um, mime is something I really enjoy. And uh, how I normally work is really similar, I can say, with historical um, references, or sort of not historical necessarily, but um, subject matter, and being inspired by it, and then collaging and sort of um, appropriating and using parts of different sources of material. But my, I don't know if it's the same. We can have more chats. Yeah. Um, mine's very subconscious to begin with. Um, I'm really very good relationship with my subconscious. I really know to trust it. And <clears throat> you, as you develop, I'll, for example, have an idea. It's often to do with sort of underdog um, subject matter. So something that I feel is not being given the um, appropriate attention in culture. And I'll share the information or the discovery with a friend or a colleague, or I'll be so excited about it, I'll turn to someone at a bus stop. It will be anyone that I share this idea with. And then the person will quite often be as excited as I am. And then from that, the bouncing of these ideas, I'll. Um, it's a little bit almost like a market research group. That I'll, uh, if, if within my group people are excited about the subject and wanting to do a mime or a party or an elaboration of it, then I'll realise that an audience would also be excited about it. So I'm, I'm quite like 
I'd say pragmatic in a way, but I do also definitely work with with um, hunches or dreams or subconscious, no problem. And and um, I am playful. I knew what you meant. That's why I was thinking, oh, maybe you would say it was play, actually, because it, it feels like play when you're watching it. Very sort of exciting play. So the title of the, of, the, of the talk is The Stage is a Safe Place, and it's a very interesting title. I started thinking about it quite a lot, and it raised lots of questions in my mind. And I suppose one of the first questions it raised for me is this issue of what the stage is. I mean, are we talking about a theatre stage, which is a very controlled um, environment with quite a lot of traditions and rules? Um, are we talking about a gallery or a museum space where the pu public can come and go freely, but they probably do have some expectation of what they're likely to see? Um, or are we talking about the sort of public space, the true public realm, which your second piece was in um, yesterday, um, where the public may have no idea... Down and dirty. Down and dirty. <laughs> We're on the street, yeah. Where, where, where the public may have no idea of um, what they're going to encounter... But I think, Sam, that you've been thinking about this issue of theatre versus the museum space and the, what, what the art world thinks of as theatre and performance quite a bit. Yes, um, I, I have. So I, I will talk about that. <laughs> um, and, yeah, well, because it, uh, for me, I kind of found the title of the talk kind of super annoying um, in the beginning because I was like... like it, that To me, there's like... It, there is a truth, but also a problem in the title, which is that, like, it's sort of like this: the stage is a safe space for people to do things that they they wouldn't normally do, they wouldn't normally be allowed to say. But I, but I also find that I think that's a truth, but I also think there's a problem in the kind of ways in which that idea manifests itself in in life. In there's something slightly also patronizing there, I think as well, where where it's actually what ends up happening is it's like y you can say what you want on the stage and you can do that on the stage, but don't do it anywhere else or, or somehow that actually the rules of engagement within the kind of institution, within the kind of uh, uh, the exhibition space are somehow different. Are you, are, you, are you making a distinction between the classical theatre space with the fourth wall and and the gallery space? I, well, no, I mean, well, obviously there is a difference between the two, but I also think also, like, even when you're talking about it, and you're like, the traditional classical stage space with, like, a fourth wall in this, where it, it becomes that those... Uh, the distinctions between these two worlds, like even in our language that we used to describe the theatre in that case, also implies a kind of... Uh, is loaded with different types of judgments, where in which I'm not so sure that the stage space is necessarily traditional, classical, or... Uh, or sort of rigid. And I, I guess what I've tried to do is think through the ways in which the methodologies taken from what is supposedly the traditional, like, classical stage space and see how what I can learn from them uh, in by, by adapting them into different contexts, whether that's, like, in the church here, whether that's in taking those performances into museums or into galleries or into the street itself. Because I think, um, for me, the... I get worried about the the kind of ways in which the discourse around the the performative or performance is still perhaps linked to ideas around authenticity and authenticity around certain bodies doing certain things in certain spaces, and that somehow those actions, those true actions, uh, as opposed to the lying actions of the stage if they are taken as such as a true sign of authenticity, um, I start to get worried. Because if I mean, we, were talking, we were in the back room, we were talking about people like Burden, we were talking about people like Okonshi, and the kind of ways in which um, sort of, like, 
uh, object, the, the dis discourses around objection, discourses around. Uh, also, I think you can also talk about feminist um, uh, performative practices in this case. That actually, at that time, people bought it, perhaps bought into a kind of political language which said that if I do this radical action in the public realm and do this truthfully, that 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 the terms of what is a visible body, what is a visible action may change. And perhaps they have done, but then at the same time, I think the ways in which that discourse led through the 80s and into the 90s also ended up into a situation in which um, that... Into the, I mean, when, like when I was at art school, I was told so many, so many times that like, uh, you know, like feminism is over, identity politics is over, all of the, so many, so many times. And I thought, well, what the hell is this? Because actually, I don't think it's over. And I worry that the, the questions around authenticity and the body that came out of the performative, the performative then was a situation which all of us bought into the politics of the visible or bought into the politics of the representable. Um, and somehow, for me, the language of the theater, as opposed to that, by being based on lying rather than the authentic, opens up a discursive possibilities around how to transcend that political question around visibility or, or, and how that visibility may li be linked to truth. Sorry if that... Blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's a really interesting point. What do you think, Samuel? Do you think there is a difference in the, the kind of performance of the 70s and then using more, more trained actors and working within the sort of sum of the language of the, of the traditional theatre? I think you were saying that, that the art world had been less accepting in a way of that kind of work. Well, I think, I mean, even that we have to talk, there's a book from 1974 called The Anti-Theatrical Prejudice by a guy called Jonah Barish. And there's an also a book called Stage Fright, um, Modernism, Theatricality, and the uh, Avant-Garde. I haven't read um, it, so I'm but, sorry. It's like a good one. Yeah, <laughs> and which talks again about what, I guess I'm interested in why this, why this distinction seems so important to to the art world in some ways, to say, no, that's theater, or that's the theatrical, that's over there. And, I, and so we, I, I want to know who, what, 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 I always ask myself, who wins by saying that? Because I think someone always wins when a rule is made. What do you think, Marvin? You're in a. I was going to say something a little bit different in that I know that I relate to the performance art groups that are from more like the 1920s and 30s, like the constructivists or the futurists and Bauhaus. And I really get excited about the theatricality and the Dada, obviously. And I don't have any problem there at all. I'm, I'm just so natural and, um, you know, like a duck to water with all of that kind of performative art. But when it came to when I, I was at art college and I remember being encouraged because I threw fancy dress parties in my home that were very elaborate. And I was encouraged to do performances under the formal title of performance within art. And I was so so opposed to it. I was so anxious because I felt so naturally opposed, I would have to say again, to the endurance art and the body politics of identity politics and everything from what we all know and really well as a group of um, a landmark uh, time in performance art in the 70s that I didn't want to do that so I, I shied away from it and I kept just doing parties in my home and nightclubs and I found it very fun and liberating and there was no problem I wasn't so so serious to um, negotiate and pin down the titles at that point I was just really quite relaxed and fun, just having a good time <laughs> and then now more recently when I get interviewed about this kind of question I really know that you can actually rather than wondering why there's a resurgence and that, for example, now, why is there an appetite for theatricality within art? Why, why am I encouraged? Why has Sam allowed me to be here and why are you invited to? And it, maybe it's just a fashionable, you know, oscillation of people being bored of the other type and excited about uh, swings and roundabouts of we're allowed to be theatrical again. But at the same time, I feel like it's 
bizarre that because somehow the body politics performances that happened made such a strong impression, somehow it eclipsed the link to the um, other very theatrical performative works that happened in the 1930s. I don't know if you relate to them at all, but I do. No, 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 abs uh, no absolutely. And I think, I think there's a very big story to be told about why those are the people that we talk about. And, and I think it has to do with um, basically the move uh, uh, of the kind of artistic center, for lack of a better word, from Paris to New York in some way. I think because also, I mean, I think a lot about um, like the Ballet Russe. I, there's like something I think about all the time. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the futurist, fut futurist actions, Dada actions, all of that stuff. But I think, in a, I mean, I think the problem, my, in my view, I think the reason why we don't talk about it so much is because it, it like beginning in the 50s and into the 60s in New York, I think there's like a conversation about skill specialization that happens. Yeah, um, I don't know, go on. No, I, I, I'm like, oh my God, did I say something really stupid? No, so it's really, um, it's, like, um, it's hard to know whether to interrupt your talking <laughs> but by trying to show uh, encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it, uh, that, like, you know, if you think, it's kind of about the rise of medium specificity, I think, as well, where, like, actually the, the story around painting and things like that, like, if you're, like, a serious artist, if you're a committed artist, you kind of have to do one thing. Well, like where I think the like really a lot of the most radical transdisciplinary work was happening in Europe between the wars. And like if you, I mean, someone else I think about a lot is someone like Cocteau or people like that who were who were writing, they were performing, they were do. The but I'd love to interrupt here because yeah, we can be friends. I can tell. Exactly. When I was at the Slade, it was dominated by. Um, uh, obviously Duchamp, no yeah. problem, and Samuel Beckett, who's also a genius as well, no problem. But they're quite dry and male and dead. And then on top of that, I was encouraged, you know, you're encouraged to try to show things that you're interested in. And I tried to screen Bella Le Bet, the right. Cocteau yeah, film, yeah, yeah, yeah. and not one person stayed. They walked out of the room. And I think it was more to do with that, it, it, anything like, you know, the... Um, the film of Enfant, Enfant du Paradis, or any of these films, the, the, the romance and the layering and the sophistication, and the, it just was unstomachable because of this annoying uh, dominance at the time. It was more like Douglas, Douglas Gordon's fault, but more like the, the very dry and academic, um, minimal kind of aesthetic. So it felt as if it dominated to a point where I, I literally remember noticing and thinking, oh my God, it's so unwelcome. No, I mean I, I mean, I totally, I, know what I, you're about. I totally agree with you because I also think in this conversation, this like question around the theatrical, like versus the performative, there is also like the question where it's like actually the art world is really scared of feelings. So, but I was about to ask do, that question. Do, you I know, was, it's like I, where actually like people are really like happy to like th to think that they're thinking, but they certainly don't want to feel like they're feeling. Yeah. And I, I and I I think you know if you and that's why so much of this stuff like has to be kind of as you say kind of expelled because actually the rules around like what looks like committed practices via or like con, like con post conceptual practices or what what like actually via Duchamp has to look in a very very certain way or else it's not serious. And, you know, it's this, I have the same thing where I was like, there's so many times where people are like, oh, you just do like really camp, uh, like, like funny, like fancy things. And I just want to be like, well, you just do really fucking boring things. And actually, like, uh, you know, because and I think it shows a real dogmatic approach to what you're supposed to be allowed to do, say, or and even um, and produce. Great. I, I, I did actually Great. wonder. I did actually wonder that Samuel. I wonder if you if you had been thinking about things like theatricality, emotion. I mean, humour also not very uh, well, you know known in a certain kind of conceptual exhibition. Were you thinking about those issues when you were thinking about this program, or were you just trying to provide a kind of overall snapshot? 
No, I was kind of uh, reflecting on last year's edition, which was a bit more somber in, in tone. And I really wanted to also um, have something that pulls people a bit more out of the chairs and out of their comfort zone, maybe. Whatever that means, you know. And I think uh, in fans' case, for example, um, I don't know in what previous conversation once, I think it was in, when we were in Bolzano, um, we spoke about also this sort of uh, almost sickness of all the shows, all the group shows, everybody wants to have a, a performance as a kind of side show or as an additional kick, you know, to, it, become, it became so popular these days that uh, we do a group show, but we need a performance on the side or as an introduction thing, you know. And then I think we spoke about the show you did at the Swiss Institute uh, in, yeah. the, in, in New York. And um, I think you were given the opportunity to do a theater work there. And instead no, no, they actually... Oh. No, but I mean, just in the sense that we we've basically the gist was that we got to the point is that that it would be great actually to do really a theatrical work and a performance that your that that has a certain duration and actually not focus on an exhibition, you know. And obviously, you are working in so many different mediums. You are using sculpture, painting, fabrication of, of so, all sort of textiles. You're writing, you're scripting, you're, you know. So I think in a lot of exhibitions, these elements co all come in. And I think uh, here it was just interesting to really channel this all onto one sort of storytelling, you know, on that stage, on that white yeah, stage. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I mean, the thing at the Swiss Institute was really funny because they asked me to come and be part of like the public program for an exhibition that they did that was based around a UNESCO play called The Chairs. And it was, I, and, I mean, it was okay, but like they, the basically the, and this goes to what we were, we were talking about, is that actually like, and, and this is, the, I think this show is kind of emblematic of like where, when the theatrical is okay, because basically it took, it took, um, the, this UNESCO play and they got loads and loads of really, really fancy design chairs and they were kind of arranged to make tableaus to sort of tell the story of the play of the chairs. And, but so basically what ends up happening in that situation is like the, the, the source text, the UNESCO play is actually stripped of its entire theatrical apparatus. It becomes just like and so in that project, I, when they were like, oh, do you want to come in and talk about this? I was like, no, I'm going to come in and I'm going to put the theater back in the room to, uh, because I don't see why. Also, for me, I don't know what you think about this, but I think it has to do with, they, about they don't, it's something about people shouldn't speak, like, like that, like, or tell stories. Like the I, do, I do know there's a strangeness in the art world where people can cope with cinema, cinema but it, they can't cope with the um, immediacy of, of the um, direct, um, someone standing up in front of them and, and, and performing. Like yeah, with, with talking. talking. Yeah, yeah, they get it, very, it's very stre they get very stressed, actually, most people in the art world. Yeah, yeah. but when we speak, they love dance, but if you talk, they get into a rage, I think. <laughs> Uh, well, what about uh, your piece, uh, Marvin? I mean, your work is often very physical. I mean, your, your, your artists' performers group get quite sort of close to the audience. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because it's, it's, it's quite an interesting experience I can definitely to be part talk, of it. I can talk about that. I can talk about anything. But I just was, can I, can I quickly cool. let a little bit of um, information that was in my head? And I, you know, when you're on a panel, you can't, you have to wait to talk. So one of the things that popped into my head, no, no, it's not, I'm happy, very happy at the moment. It's great. The, the thing that um, jumped in my head, which is quite fascinating to me, is that we're allowed to perform in churches here. So is that that they're Protestant? Are they Protestant, the churches? In most they, cases, yes. Yeah, because it's so interesting. If you think of Pussy Riot in Russia, if you think of, I just don't know how to say it. Like, it's so obviously, I've been brought up Catholic. And the idea, when we were like, in the costumes we were at, we were in upstairs in a changing room, this wonderful room with very heavy going religious paintings on the walls. And there was a level where you, I found the toleration, the tolerance incredible. Like, does it make sense? Like, I found that extraordinary. That I don't know if it's just the churches need money to pay for their heating bills or whatever it is. So therefore they, you know, the, the, it's, that's how they earn their income. But at the same time, I found it quite almost disturbing that the churches were the, because I realized that your, yours is a church as well. It's the not theaters we've been performing in 
church spaces. That's something that's just popped up in my head. Yeah, it was a weird for me. We had a little kind of like sort of rape scene that we had to stage. And and there and we are like at a like eleven thirty at night, and we'd already been told like a hundred times like you have to shut all the lights off at ten o'clock because the grannies that live next door to the church are gonna get into a rage, and I was so paranoid because we you know like one actress is screaming and people are throwing their clothes in the air and I was expecting like you know the police to come or something but no everyone was really nice. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, that was just something that came up. We can maybe talk more about it. I don't know, because it's really, it is really, that, that's unusual for me. The, the series of art actually has, some of the venues have been religious spaces, but totally tolerant. Really interesting. Um, uh, the, the question about the, uh, physicality. Yeah, physicality with the audience. And, um, mm. you know, there's a slightly sexual undertow in some of it. And uh, I, wondered, uh, I, I, I wondered how it felt for you and the performers to be doing that with the audience. I don't know. I sort of, uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I was going to talk, I don't know how to say it. Like, it's not that I don't want to answer the question, but another thing's popping into my head instead of answering that was that I was really, I've been brought up to go to see high end theatrical and opera, to go to mainstream theatre. And the most inspiring things I've ever been to are, for example, a Shostakovich play about football, a, a Shostakovich ballet about football from the 1930s. And Another one would be a production of Oedipus Rex at the National Theatre. Um, another one would be a kabuki play at Sadler's Wells. What happens to me during the productions is there's spellbinding moments, and I'm completely, insanely uh, seduced by the suspension of disbelief. I don't understand it's not real. And I'm excited by the simplicity and economy of the production that's made that spell and encapsulation happen. So. I think I would say I am very much a case of someone who's aping something rather wonderful, and I am aware that I'm just doing it in a DIY fashion, DIY, doing it myself, a sort of bastardized version, a fan. I am a fan, as it were. But what's really fascinating about the generosity of the art world is that since leaving college, I have been nothing but encouraged on many occasions with many opportunities and many spaces, and. I have developed to be taken seriously as an artist. So not only is my bastardization and my aping now has become a, an aesthetic and a taken seriously political form of decision making, it seems. It's like everyone seems to take it terribly seriously because I've got a drive and I've got follow through and it will all happen. Of course it will. I'm behind it kind of. But at the same time, I'm, I'm really aware of, of my relationship to the mainstream theatre and my adoration of it or my um, respect for it. And I would say that maybe I can link it to your question, but th there's a level where I'm fully aware that I represent something that's almost, and again, someone I really respect is John Waters, but something that seemed to be vile, scum, dregs, like marginalized shit, whatever, you know, terrible. But at the same time, oh no, hang on. Yeah, like the classic thing of being either seen to be abysmal or at best it's punk. Like there's a level where I completely understand that. But what I find enhancing is audience are sophisticated. People are sophisticated. They, they know what's happening in front of them. So whether it's an edgy sexual thing or whether it's got a kind of political edge to it or whether it's just something saccharine, the, my, ex, my experience this week has been that the audience has absolutely been amazing and responsive and excited and uh, understood everything. So even if, um, like maybe I'm coming around to answer your question, but actually through this conversation I found it uplifting because we're talking about something I really love and care a lot about, like theatre and, and ballet or opera. I find it incredible. I'm a total culture junkie and I want to contribute to culture. But um, when it comes down to what I make, normally I make it with my own hands and my own passion and sort of DIY emergency like energy. So it comes across to look really quite shabby or bad, but it has a lot of um, energy to it. And I would answer you and say the audience knows what's going on. Yeah. Sorry it was so long. 
Yeah, that was answer. a very, very, very interesting answer. I mean, in fact, <laughs> on the subject of the audience, I, I, we, everyone was promised an opportunity to answer, some, to, uh, to be able to ask some questions. So I think, as I see the time is flying by, that perhaps I should throw that option open to people. Um, if you can throw your hand up, I think there's microphones around. And if you're all being a bit shy or maybe a bit tired from last night... Oh, OK, the lady in the blue. Sarah, in fact. Hello. <laughs> I see who you are now. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a general question about um, collecting performance art. So if, for example, an institution acquired a piece, um, are they buying the idea and therefore perhaps when they choose to exhibit it, they could choose who they might like to perform in it, for example? Or is this something the artist always has control over and something you would um, you know, have a, always have a part in? I, I have a feeling you'll have more experience with this than I do. I've got, I've got some, lots of experience with this recently because in the last couple of years my work's been collected by um, a very interesting museum in Leicester for its first, called the New Walk Museum, and it has a great collection of uh, Germanist, German Expressionist painters. But I, I, I didn't know you'd been collected by them. It's a really interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, OK. They're the, they're the first ones, to be honest. That I mean, actually, Migros has been really supportive. They were, they were collecting, but they were collecting the products. But again, this is really pro-Switzerland. But, but oh my god, I was so surprised that the people who work at Migros, some of them are in education, so they're doing PhDs at the same time as working. Whereas what happens in Britain, poor people basically working and committing to studying, when they finish their studies, they've got no guarantee of actual employment. So I was really impressed by lots of the systems in Migros. But one of the, the people working there was writing a PhD on how to collect uh, products from performances, the, the residue of performances. So I was very lucky in a weird way from 2007 to have very good uh, conversations with the problem solving of how do you deal with something that's not made archivally but is wanting to be put into a collection. I really love the problem solving in all of this. I love the kind of group jigsaw puzzle of it all. And then I would say I look to lots of Latin American artists who make very ephemeral and, and uh, temporary art. And they all have clever systems of writing um, basically like uh, instructions for the future to remake the, the work. And I would definitely mention Tino Segal on that horizon and trajectory of, of how art has been becoming impossible to collect and contain mayhem is being contained by various formulas of contracts, spoken word contracts, all that, really interesting. I would also say that I've had a really bizarrely flattering experience because the Contemporary Art Society in Britain was trying to collect an artist's, performance artist's work, but they went through a long list and they chose me, and it's because, I think this answers your question a bit, is that I'm not controlling the, um, so say I'm, I'm dead and the museum will put on the work in the future, I'm not writing a, a rigorous rule list that when the work was re-enacted would become very dead. I'm allowing a lot of interpretation and spontaneity to still... Um, I'm, I'm making a formula, and it is like writing a play, a score for a play or music, and there are lots of hilarious videos of me doing like almost like cooking programs, showing how to make things. And for example, my, my colleagues are in the audience now, but. I would say that, for example, you need to hang out a lot even outside of the rehearsal time. A lot of like quite bizarre involved um, watching subject matter together, a lot of very involved um, require, um, specific instructions. But I would say it's really, it, I, it sounds embarrassing because I'm in the art fair and why am I here? But I'm trying to explain that I'm actually really into the problem solving of collecting performance. I'm interested, I'm not running away from it. So it's not just because I want to make heaps of money. It's actually because I'm super... Um, well, intellectually, it's, it's, it's totally a fascinating holds your question. Fast, exactly. Yeah, totally. Go, go. Good. Um, uh, um, I've never had someone try to buy a performance. So I've, I've, I, uh, I, I think the way that I would do it, like if someone wants... Like I would... That I, like almost that they would be able to like buy... The, I, I, I don't know, they, they, could, they could have the script and they would be able to perform it over, like, you know, that they would, they would almost like a play text exists in, in other terms, like if, if you want to put on Genet, you have, to, uh, you have to pay a bit to the Genet estate to get the, yeah, it's like something like that. 
But no, I think I agree that actually intellectually it's a fascinating uh, conundrum to try to come up uh, with how the right way to the right way to do it. Just been around unlimited. I'm sounding so into Basel. Oh my God! Listen to me. I've just been around unlimited, and I got really excited by seeing the Mike Kelly piece, and that's a really good example of someone I thought. I mean, maybe everyone thinks differently, but you felt really like he was bloody alive. You felt like he was in the room or something because it felt so. It felt very well presented and fascinatingly. Um, I don't know how to say it, like Allegra, like alive, kind of. Yeah, it was exciting, full of energy. But you, but you do, um, you do have uh, make objects, don't you? As well, are they part of your performances that you sell separately, or are they, are they, are they made as in their own right, or how it does that work? It depends um, sometimes because, again, talking about this, uh, like, as the scale of my performative ambitions got bigger, I realized that more and more. Um, that actually setting what I want to do in the space, in, a, in an institutional space or in a gallery space, but became more and more problematic because if the running time is four and a half hours, you know, and you, d the, it's, you come up with a lot of like, that is too long, that is too much, we can't have that because, and so it, it, it and so I try to experiment between, um, so, between some time, like with the project at MIT, finally we did it back in the museum again. And so then the, actually the objects in that case of the exhibition became up used in the play. Uh, recently in Paris, I, there was a situation where some of the objects in the exhibition were then used in the play. Um, and then this time around, uh, everything in, was produced specifically for the play, but then there were works in the booth that came out of my thinking around the play. If that, so it goes back and forth. You know, I try not to be too rigid about it because it's. I like to, you know, I'd like to just get on with it. You know what I mean? I, I don't want to stress about it. Yeah, I don't want to stress. You know, and it's like it just got it just got to the point where I was I was like I didn't want to have to deal. If I want it to be four hours, like it's gonna be four, I, then I need to find a situation where it can be four hours. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, do you know what I, you know what I mean? Instead of tra fighting with people about like, oh, can it be fifteen minutes? You know, and then I'm like, no. So. Um, I mean, people talk a lot about technology, and I just wondered, Samuel, and there's, there's obviously, I think it is clear that there has been growing interest from audiences, museums, curators, everybody in different kinds of performance works. And I just wondered how much you think that relates to technology, that we want to see the real body and the real live action rather than something on social media. Well, I think um, we're experiencing live and alternate life experiences now on so many different levels through social media and, and real, <laughs> real uh, encounters. I think... Um, it's playing a, a huge role in, in, in regards to actually concentration and focus and actually capturing the audience in a way that uh, sort of makes sense to your own way of storytelling. I think we're actually distracting by a lot of social media channels and it's great to actually get visibility. You want to see what happened at the Venice Biennale, you look at you know, what Anne Imhof did there and you can see 10 different, 150 different angles. But I think there's something quite extraordinary to actually then... Um, yeah, to engage in this in this uh, direct manner with with your presentations, for example. But I think I, w I, d I quickly wanted to ask something else that I was still curious of before we end, you know, because obviously you put so much energy yourself in it, and I think the the question of temporality and duration is you know very now quite different in both your cases. I mean, you've done yesterday also two hour mega thing, you know, but um, you know there's something explosive and you kind of react immediately to the people in the audience and to your other performers, Marvin, and it's like, it's, it's a almost immediate feedback. It's like a live feedback to everything that's around you, you know? And, and you, it's like, uh, it's, uh, it feels almost like you're, you're mastering this, uh, just this incredible volume of information that you're trying to transmit to people and you're going through it and 
all these actors have learned so much information and you're, you're telling this huge story and uh, you're saying, for example, um, you're, people get right away what you're, what you're doing, you know? There's an immediate response, you know? An instinctive and intuitive level, yes. Very intuitive, yes. you know? And how, how do you, for example, feel? Because, like, for example, Monday, you said something funny to me after the first uh, Monday evening performance. You said, like, uh, after one hour, you said, like, oh, I was surprised that no more people walked out of it. Uh, and, yeah. You know, so, as it's, it's, so it's, it seems to be also that you're, not that you're testing the audience, but there's obviously a, you're telling a story, it starts at point A, it goes on and on and on, and... Uh, and it goes, to, and the it goes end. to the end. Yeah. And you're not, are you expecting people to understand or to connect right away? Or is it, or why did, why did you, for example, say this? It's just interesting. Um, well, I mean, I think it has to, it has to do with, uh, um, because of a, if you think of this the question of attention spans, that like in, in this context, in like uh, an exhibition context, in like people are not usually asked to or to sit for three and a half hours and listen. Do you know what I mean? That's not, and, and it's fair enough, it's not part of the contract that sort of the kind of, the, what I would say, like the kind of staged encounter that people are used to within within an artwork or some, uh, with something like that. Um, so, I mean, I do, every time I tell, I, the actors I work with, they, they come from the theater world, I would be, I'm always like, this will be the most terrible audience that you will have experienced because people come in for 10 minutes, they walk out, they go like this, they, they don't follow the, nor, the, 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 the same rules of engagement. But I think it also, um, so I, I do say that to them. And to answer your question, do I expect you? Know, do I expect people to get it immediately? Or? I mean, you 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 uh, you you already have an expect you already have an expectation to the audience. That well, I mean, this this is the thirteenth play I've done in this context, so it's like I know how it how it goes. And ironically, like last night was uh, one of the time actually was that. But what happened was because of the setup of the parkour night and the kind of question of circulation and people circulating from one to the next, it was actually the first time that like it, the, this kind of in and out scenario actually worked in our favor because people would, were constantly coming in and out. And usually it's like a constant stream the other way. Um, and, and I don't take that as a kind of insult. I just take that as that like people, people aren't, they, they're just not used to it. You know, and it goes um, to this. Because I, I know we're meant to open up to the audience as well. Uh, yeah. But Hi. No, because no, I was gonna, I was gonna just say that I would, I would think it, this is embarrassing because it sounds so ridiculous. But I actually think about Shakespeare <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when yeah. I'm doing no, these productions, yeah. which is probably insane to people. But it's because you, you understand. Um, I don't want to. I don't underestimate the audience's intelligence. You actually understand that within a Shakespearean play, there's, there's, well, there's three acts, there's, there's famous like patterns of concentration. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know your question was about the internet and, and how we're all changing, but I'd say we're all pretty human still. And, Thank and, God. and there's a level where with um, why plays work and why there are these traditions of, you know, whether it's Kabuki or whether it's Shakespeare or whatever it is, is because it's been tried and tested. And, and for example, you know within the tragedy there's the comic relief and there's these, there's these patterns to aid it's a, people. It's a question mm. of dramaturgy and that you try to develop a, a story to be able to... Oh, please, go. Yeah, good. And, and I think, unfortunately, we will have to wrap after, up after this because the time has just flown by. So, sorry, yes, the lady yeah, in the dress. It's just a short... Uh, it's very interesting, and uh, now we came so, to a very interesting point also to me um, as a creator. And, uh, Tan, you said it, um, like um, uh, the rules of engagement. I, I, I just uh, would like to know of the, of the artists and also of, uh, of the creators, so how you how you engage with this rule of engagement in, in sure. such time I, I duration think, plays? Well, I think what I, the way I uh, often talk about it in, in theatrical terms is that I think the way that we are trained um, in our mode of encounter with 
ob objects after a certain point, it, you could talk about through a kind of Brechtian model or a kind of, of alienation. And it goes to what you're talking about, about this kind of suspension of disbelief thing. And it, it, in, it, and it goes to this, also in this book stage, right, where like, we are, our expectation when we encounter, the, the rules of engagement are when I encounter an object, I am estranged from it because it's sort of like something I understand, it's sort of like something I don't understand, and that for that's supposed to make me think differently about the object that it reminds me of. For like a, a kind of that's a crass way of talking about it. But so so and when I and, and that and that's how we've learned to encounter objects and learned to look. But I, I guess the really interesting thing about the theatrical is that it opens up other ways of looking and other ways of having an engagement with the object. And uh, there's a book by a woman called Juliet Coach that talks about modern, it's called Modernism After Wagner. And it goes, to, it's amazing. And it goes to this question of counter to the Brechtian model of perception or engagement with the object is this question of the suspension of disbelief. Um, and and if you think of like the work of the Dadaists and the Futurists, was very much built around in terms of the staging of the event, was very much about breaking away from that question of the, the suspension of disbelief in some in some ways. Like they wanted to step away from that. And I so I've tried. I uh, I think it's interesting because. I, again, I don't like rules, you know, and I think that way of like, okay, it sticks. I love rules. I, mean, I like rules in my work, <laughs> but I like rules, but I don't, I don't, I don't like rules. I don't like hidden rules. Me? It's hilarious if you, I don't know how to say it, if you, if the, we're getting on really well. I definitely want to be friends, but there's a level where there's your your work is really fascinating actually because you're setting up such a hard um, task for the audience. If if an audience was meant to sit for four hours, yeah. yeah. And I don't know how to say it. Like, my thing is meant to be so sprawling and easygoing, and I don't even care if the performers who arrive don't turn up. I just don't even care about it. See, anything. that would stress me out massively. <laughs> that would really... And then I'm laughing because I'm the one saying I like the rules, but my rules are to not get... Does it make sense? Like, they're yeah, it's quite hilarious. Um, eat a banana every day. But I think... So... But I think... Yeah, no, I mean, like, there's different ways of... But parameters. I know parameters mean, yeah, of how to, have fun to within in, and like, within. in like this so with this question of like the submersive could perhaps like uh, like in terms of the suspension of disbelief could this question around the suspension of disbelief or uh, submersion rewrite the ways in which we again have been taught to think about what is a critical object or or a critical way of engaging with uh, cultural practices. But, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that this is a bit of a marriage made in heaven and that you two are going to talk for the next few hours. So, um, but I fear that, uh, that our time has come to an end. And I, I, I want to say thank you very much for you all not sloping away like the audiences you were describing. <laughs> um, thank you for sticking with us for, I think, a really fascinating talk. And there was so much more to ask. I had masses more questions, which we've got nowhere near. Um, it's a good way to end the final conversation for this, uh, this Art Basel. Um, so I feel that I must say thank you to Mark Spiegler, the director, for inviting us all. Thank you for Mary Spirito for um, putting together this program. She's curated the program. I, she was here at the beginning. I'm not sure if she's here now. Thank you very much to Annelie Graff, who did all the project management and kind of organized us all. Um, thank you very much to our speakers, Samuel, Than, and Marvin. It's been fascinating. And thank you very much. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>